Hey everybody, in this episode, I'm going to be continuing work on the e-voting application I've been doing for the last several episodes. And in this one, I'm going to be deploying using Capistrano, the popular Rails deployment tool, with Docker, and I'm going to try to get them to work. So let's get started. When it comes to deployment for Rails applications on a plain Linux server, there are two main options. You've got Capistrano and Amina. Heroku is its own kind of platform altogether, Git deploy is no longer maintained, and as far as I know, the other two here are on Ruby Toolbox, Rubber, and Moonshine are built on top of Capistrano. The main difference between Capistrano and Minna is that Capistrano does an SSH into your production server and runs each deployment command individually. Whereas Minna utilizes a very similar setup for your application, but instead of running the commands over SSH, it generates a bash script that gets stored on your production server and therefore can run the commands a lot faster because the entire deploy process itself is managed from the server by just executing one command over SSH. However, I'm going to be using Capistrano for this video because it's so widely used and I'm more certain about how well it handles error recovery. Maybe we could have a closer look at Mina or Mina, I'm not exactly sure how you're supposed to say it, in a future episode. So right now I'm going to walk you through the steps of setting up Capistrano. The first step is adding Capistrano to the development section of your gem file. And normally, in addition to the base Capistrano gem, developers often add Capistrano plugins to help them automate the typical Rails application setup tasks on the server. Things like the Capistrano Rails gem, Bundler, and Puma for the web server running Rails. However, we're not going to be needing those plugins because on my production server, I'm going to be running the entire Rails setup and application through a Docker container. Now, mixing Docker and Capistrano is a bit of an unconventional deployment setup because Capistrano isn't really built for Docker deployment. But I figured out a way to make it work anyway. All we have to do is to get Capistrano to run the commands to build and restart the container. I like this method for small single server applications. In a more conventional Docker deployment setup, you would usually build the Docker image for your application and push it to a repository like Docker Hub. You would probably have a continuous integration and deployment system like CircleCI or GitHub Actions build the image and run the script to get that image on your server. In my setup, because it's a single server, I'm just going to bypass that complexity and use a production server for my production build too every time I deploy. Now just in case you're new to Docker and you don't know the difference between a Docker container and an image, the image is the saved data for your application. So you could think of it like the hard drive for a virtual machine where all the software is installed and configured. The container is the instance of the image and you can start and stop the container and run as many parallel containers as you want for a given image. Now, why do I want to use Docker for my production setup anyway? I like the idea of how it packages the way you can run your application. The Ruby image and all of its dependencies can be configured uniformly across my development and production environments. No need to worry about the Ruby version being incorrect or a dependency like Nokogiri being able to build in my local environment but fail when I push to production due to some quirky system-specific issue. Also, process management becomes simpler because the application is managed by Docker. Remember, in my video Stonks on Rails Episode 3, I had a production server issue running a separate thread for my background jobs. I was able to easily resolve that by running the jobs in a separate Docker container process. If I'm having any trouble running my application, I can just do a docker ps to see what's running on the server and use docker compose commands to restart any containers. So back to our gem file, we've added the Capistrano gem to our development group and this is because Capistrano is meant to be run from your development environment on your local machine. Your app is going to run in production mode on the server, but your computer is actually spinning up a development instance of Capistrano and running all the commands on the server through an SSH session. We don't need the Capistrano Rails gem for this setup because we're going to use custom Docker commands to run the asset pipeline and the database migrations during the build process. 
So now we got the bundle installed. I'm going to do a cap install and that's going to set up the Capistrano specific configuration files in our local environment. So here the cap install placed some of the files that we need for Capistrano to run and be configured. We've got the cap file, which is a place where you would enable or disable some of the additional libraries and overall configuration setup for Capistrano. Here's our deploy file where we could make special settings on how our application is going to run on server and how it's going to be deployed. And here in the deploy folder, we've got production and staging files for specific settings to the environment. Now in the deploy RB file, I'm going to first set up the deploy to variable, which specifies the folder location on the production server where the application will reside. And then I'm going to have to log into the server in an SSH session and create that folder and also sets permissions accordingly. Capistrano lets you create your own custom deployment steps to run through rake tasks. In the documentation, there's an example of a deployment task that you can create that checks whether the destination folder on the production server is properly configured. Let's go ahead and write that now. We can see that the shell command cap-t now shows our newly created task on the rake task list. And we can run that to get confirmation that our program's destination is ready. Now I'm going to set up the git repo URL for the project and run another Capistrano task to check that it can access git properly from the production server. So for the deployment, Capistrano is going to SSH from my local system into the production server, and then it'll do a pull down of the latest code from git. Now when we run the git check command, it raises an error to let us know that it can't access GitHub. And that's because I need to install the server's public key on my GitHub account. Now the git check task passes. Next, I'm going to configure the linked file and linked dir's configuration settings. This is going to designate which files get retained and shared between deploys. Mainly, these are files that are either generated on the server by the application, such as logs, or files that we need in production but won't get checked into our source repository, like the environment settings file. Capistrano production server setup looks like this. There's a releases folder with subfolders named by a timestamp of the deploy that created them. Each release has a copy of the program source code from that deploy. Within the releases folder, every file that you specify in that linked files and linked dirs arrays get symlink to the shared folder. So I'm going to run the production deploy task right now, and this is just going to install the code from GitHub onto the server. Once this task successfully runs, we can log on and look at what's there so that you can see that the .env file is symlink to shared, and the log directory is also symlink to shared. If we move up a level, we can see that the current folder is symlink to the releases folder. Now, symlinks are all fine if you're running a standard Rails application from the shell, but our application is running from within a Docker container. What your application is going to see within the Docker container is a symlink file with a nonsensical reference. In order for the symlink to work within the running Docker container, we have to move up a level and replicate our symlinks using Docker commands. Specifically, I'm going to set up a Docker Compose production file that will make use of the volumes directive and establish Docker-based symlinks within the container that point to these shared files on the outside file system. So I'm going to have my base Docker Compose file, Docker Compose.override, which I'm going to be using for development with some development environment specific settings that automatically kick in when I do Docker Compose up. And for production, I'm going to specify the Docker Compose files to run explicitly when I start the containers. So Docker Compose override is going to be ignored, and it's going to run Docker Compose.yaml, and then on top of those settings, apply the Docker Compose.production as overrides. Now that we've got the environment specific file links taken care of, the last thing that we need to get right is the specialized task that we're going to run as an afterhook that builds the Docker container and reloads any currently running containers. Let's go ahead and call this build and restart Docker container. There should be a minimal amount of downtime since the container build will be going on simultaneously with the currently running web application. And once the build is finished, 
we can just kill the existing container process and upstart the newly built container with the latest code. Here's my first draft of the afterhook script. The script pretty much follows the build steps outlined in the Docker Compose documentation for deploy to production, which is basically just build and restart the container. Also notice that all of the commands I'm running are in word-based arrays, and this is because of the way that commands are passed into SSHKit, the SSH engine used by Capistrano. The array helps ensure spaces are handled properly in commands sent over SSH. So let's add our new task to the afterhook in deploy.rb, and we'll give this a run. And the container fails to build and gives us this file permissions error. By the way, this is one of the things that I do like about Capistrano, is that I know that its error logging is pretty solid. As for the cause of the error, I'd like to save you footage of about three hours of me banging my head against the wall trying to figure this one out. The issue turned out to be a bug in the Docker software that affected Alpine 3.15, the version of the container OS that we're running. Just one of those software incompatibility issues. So I upgraded Docker on my production system to version 20, which consequently broke the other program that I was running on the server, and yada yada yada, the containers and an Nginx restart later, my US Treasury Yield Curve site is back up, and this eVoting app finally builds. Now when I run cap production deploy, there's a new error related to the Docker Compose network and volume settings. Recall in the last video when I was exploring Docker, I set external to true on that setting in my Docker Compose file. And that means that Docker is expecting the name Docker Networks and volumes to already exist. Let's go ahead and create them using the appropriate commands. So we're past that error. Now there's a problem with the naming of the containers. In Docker Compose, I give explicit names of the containers to run so that I can easily reference them in Docker commands. Without this setting, Docker would assign a unique name to each container. Starting and stopping containers with the same name normally wouldn't cause us any issue, but Capistrano's directory structure with the releases is causing us a problem. Because each deploy goes into a different release folder, Docker considers each release to be an independent application, even though they're sharing the same container names. So if we initiate a Docker container in one folder, and then initiate a restart command in another, there's going to be a naming conflict because the restarting app in the new release folder is going to be considered a different application that has a name conflict with the currently running existing container. So the way that we work around this is by explicitly shutting down the running container by name and deleting it, and then starting the new container out of the new release directory. So that's out of the way. Now there's another problem with the Rails environment not realizing that we're in production mode. And this one's another third-party bug, a problem with the .env gem. No worries, we can fix this by explicitly setting that environment variable one level above in our Docker Compose production file. And if we want, since we're using Docker, we can discontinue our use of the .env gem altogether and just use the Docker Compose file to read the .env file and set the environment variables in the container that way. All right, so we have another attempt, another error. This time we have to set the Rails production secret, which would be a required task with or without Docker. So we could generate that and add it to our .env file. Finally, we get a successful deploy and an automated restart of our containers. So now let's log into the Rails console and start making some initial seed data. I don't have the domain and HTTPS set up through the Nginx proxy yet, so let's try retrieving a web page from the server using curl. And as you can see, we get the Rails error page, and that's because there's one more task to do. We have to add the Rails asset pipeline compilation rake task to our deployment process so that it can access the styling and associated JavaScript files in production mode. I'm going to go ahead and add that build step to our Capistrano deployment and also add the Docker volumes link so that our public folder contents and anything cached there will remain persistent between deploys. And once those tasks are done, 
we finally have a working application. So here are my concluding thoughts on using Capistrano as a deployment tool if you're using Docker in production. I think Capistrano is a great Ruby on Rails tool and is very well specifically tailored to deploying Rails in a production environment on a production server. It gives you special plugins that let you do things like run rake tasks, you could configure RVM, uh, some of the web server uh, plugins that Rails uses, it's got special ways to configure that, running Bundler. All of those things are great, but here's the problem, is that if you're using Docker and you've configured your Docker Compose correctly, you don't really need those features that Capistrano has to offer. In fact, some of Capistrano's best features even work against you when you're trying to deploy a Rails app in this fashion. So as we've seen, we've had to do some workarounds because the symbol links can be problematic uh, that Docker uses because when your application's running, it's inside of the Docker container. The symbol links on the file system created by Capistrano don't translate well into your Docker container. So you have to use the Docker volumes to create your own second layer of symbol links to link to the correct shared data. And also the rolling release folder structure, which is great for rolling back a failed deployment, causes you problems uh, when you're using Docker because Docker is starting up in a different folder each time you deploy, and that could cause some naming conflicts in uh, starting up your containers. So you have to work around that problem. So overall, while I think Capistrano is still a great tool for deployment, it's somewhat of a suboptimal setup. In other words, I think you're probably better off using a tool that's more specifically tailored to pulling down a Docker image or building the code in the same folder and then running it. And for that, you probably don't need a Capistrano. In fact, I wish you could turn off some of Capistrano's features and just keep everything in a single folder. That would make it a lot easier. So if you found this video useful, and I hope you did, go ahead and give it a like and subscribe to my channel because I've got a lot more Ruby on Rails content and programming content planned here. Also, if you join my Patreon, you could get access to the source code for this project and run through it as you're watching the video and explore it on your own. So with that said, I'll see you in the next video.